Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to three new members of our Patreon, Carolyn, Shahar, and Lois. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of our Patreon, you help cover production and distribution costs that make it possible to keep making new episodes week after week and keep it ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in learning more about Patreon and the exclusive perks available to subscribers, you'll find a link in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's relax with some reading. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice, deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight... Let's relax with The Book of the Ocean by Ernest Ingersoll, author of Knockin' Round the Rockies, The Oyster Industries of the United States, Friends Worth Knowing, Wild Neighbors, The Crest of the Continent, etc. First published in 1898 by The Century Company, New York. Let's begin. The Book of the Ocean Chapter 1 The Ocean and Its Origin Looking at the land, we divide the surface of the earth into eastern and western hemispheres. But looking at the water, we make an opposite classification. Encircle the globe in your library with a rubber band so that it cuts across South America from about Porto Alegre to Lima on one side and through southern Siam and the northernmost of the Philippine Islands on the other, and you make hemispheres, the northern of which, with London at its center, contains almost all the land of the globe, while the southern, with New Zealand as its central point, is almost entirely water. Australia and the narrow southern half of South America being the only lands of consequence in its whole area. Observing the map in this way, noticing that, besides nearly a complete half-world of water south of your rubber equator, much of the northern hemisphere also is afloat, you are willing to believe the assertion that there is almost three times as much of the outside of the earth hidden under the waves as appears above them. The estimate in round numbers is 150 million square statute miles of ocean, as compared with about 50 million square miles of land on the globe. To the people whose speculations in geography are the oldest that have come down to us, the earth seemed to be an island around which was perpetually flowing a river with no further shore visible. Beyond it, they thought, lay the abodes of the dead. This river, as the source of all other rivers and waters, was deified by the early Greeks and placed among their highest gods as Oceanus, whence our word ocean. Accompanying or belonging to him, there grew up in the fertile imagination of that poetic people a large company of gods and goddesses, while men hid their absence of real knowledge by peopling the deep with quaint monsters. The word for ocean, mare, in the Latin tongue, means by derivation a desert, and the Greeks spoke of it as the barren brine. Over these old fables, we need not linger. 
All the myths and guesswork that went before history represented the sea as older than the land and told how creation began by lifting the earth above the universal waste of waters. The story in Genesis is only one of many such stories. Scientific men believe that when our planet first went circling swiftly in its orbit, it was a glowing, globular mass of fiery vapors. But as time passed, the icy chill of space slowly cooled these vapors, and chemical changes steadily modified, sorted, and solidified the materials into the beginnings of the present form and character, until at last water came into existence. This must have been at first in the form of a thick envelope of heated vapors, impregnated with gases, that enwrapped the globe in a darkness lit only by its own fire. After that, when further changes had come about, let us picture it, what deluges of rain were poured out of and down through those murky clouds where thunders bellowed and lightnings warred. At first, all the rains that fell must have been turned to steam again, but by and by the steady downpour cooled the shaping globe so that all the water was not vaporized but some stayed as a liquid where it fell, and this increased in amount more and more, until finally, between the hissing core of the half-hardened planet and the dense clouds which kept out all the sunlight, there rolled the heated waves of the first ocean, an ocean broken only by the earliest ridges, like chains of islands, marking the skeletons of the continents that were to follow. An ocean sending up ceaseless volumes of steam to form new clouds. Yet all the while the cooling of the planet went on. Now when any heated substance cools it contracts, and the globe as a whole is no exception to the rule but a sphere formed of so incompressible a substance as rock can shrink only by some sort of folding or displacement of its surface. Therefore, as the cooling of our globe proceeded, explosions and swellings constantly occurred at weak points or lines on or near the surface, where the prodigious strain forced a break. That these upheavals were most prominent and extended in the northern hemisphere is shown by the fact that the great masses and heights of land are grouped there, and the trend of mountain ranges seems to show that the range of breakage and upheaval were in general in north and south lines. Elsewhere, and mainly in the southern hemisphere, Broad areas of perhaps stiffer crust sank downward, making the vast depressions into which poured the waters of the primeval sea and where our oceans still sway and roll. All these changes, however, have been in the direction of ensuring more and more stability, and when the ocean water had thoroughly cooled, the very chill of its vast masses in the depths of the troughs assisted in the work. For the cold water, by more rapidly withdrawing their heat, caused the rocks beneath their basins to become denser, thicker, stronger, and consequently less liable to break or change than were those rocks forming the foundations of the continents. The moment it had shores to beat upon, that moment the ocean began to knock them to pieces under its pounding surf, and to grind the fragments so small that they could be drifted away, reassorted, 
and deposited wherever the water was sufficiently quiet to let them fall. The original rocks, chiefly granite, held the different forms of lime, magnesia, etc., to make the limestones, the silica to make the gritty sandstones, the alumina to make the clays, and so on. The sea not only was the agent to eat this old, rich crust to pieces and respread it into strata, but to sort out for us the materials to a considerable extent, laying down beds of limestone by themselves, and sandstone, shales, marl, etc. by themselves. It is probable, says Professor Shaler, that layers of rock 20 miles in thickness have thus been laid down on the gradually settling ocean floor, much of which has been raised again to form continental lands. Hitherto we have spoken of the waters that surround the continents as if they formed one mass, as practically they do. But for convenience sake, we may designate certain areas by separate names, which ought now to be defined. Thus, the larger, more open spaces are known as oceans. And of these, five are recognized, namely Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and Antarctic. Parts or branches of these, more or less enclosed by land, and usually comparatively shallow, are termed seas. The Pacific Ocean is the largest, it alone covering more space than all the continents combined, having a breadth east and west of 10,000 miles, about the length of the Atlantic and an area of 70 million square miles. The equator divides it into the North and South Pacific. The former is comparatively free from islands and is enclosed northward by the approaching extremities of Alaska and Siberia, while the latter widens at the south into the boundless Antarctic Ocean its basin is a vast depression of fairly uniform depth, studded in the western part by island peaks, the summits of submerged volcanic mountain ranges. The name Pacific, Peaceful, was given to it by Magellan, its first navigator in 1540. In his joy at having escaped from the tempestuous experience he had long endured in the South Atlantic. On the whole, the Pacific deserves its name as compared with the Atlantic, a fact chiefly due to its great size. The term South Sea was formerly much used for it but English-speaking persons now usually mean by that phrase the island-studded district between Hawaii and Australia. The Atlantic commemorates in its name the myth of Atlas and his island. Atlas seems to have been originally among the Greeks, the name of the peak of Tenerife, of which they had vague information from the earlier Phoenician sea wanderers. Then this was forgotten, and in place of the fact arose a myth of a titan who stood upon a vast island in or beyond the western sea, called Atlantis. Legends of wars with its people form a part of the nebulous hero story of the beginnings of Athens, and it is said to have sunk out of sight long before records began. There have always been those who believe this story founded upon fact, and only a few years ago a book was printed in the United States 
arguing that the tale was the history of a real land. But not only is there no literary or historical evidence that Atlantis had any firmer foundation than vague memories of the Cape Verde or Canary Islands, but every evidence of the geological condition and history of the eastern shores and bed of the Middle Atlantic Ocean shows that no such convulsion as the destruction of this island calls for ever took place there, or that there was ever such a land to be submerged. The Atlantic occupies a long, winding, comparatively narrow trough that measures about 10,000 miles north and south, from the ice of the Antarctic to the ice of the Arctic Ocean, and has only a few islets south of Iceland, the Faroes and the Shetlands, which rise from a plateau stretching from Labrador to Great Britain, the higher points of which were probably above the water within comparatively recent geological time, possibly since man appeared upon the globe. The average depth of the Atlantic south of this ridge is about 13,000 feet, but greater depths are found along the African and American coasts, on each side of a long submerged ridge from which rise the isolated islands of Cape Verde, St. Helena, and Tristan da Cunha. The width from Norway to Greenland is only about 800 miles, but between Montevideo and Cape Town it is 3,600 miles, and the average width is about 3,000 miles. The shape and situation of the Atlantic make it the most stormy of the three great oceans, and it is the one where the phenomena of tides, currents, etc. are most prominently manifested, as we shall see. It is also the most frequented and best known, because it has been necessary to study it for the benefit of commerce. The Indian Ocean is simply the extension of the vast southern water zone northward of parallel 40 degrees south latitude, where from the Cape of Good Hope to Tasmania it is 6,000 miles in width. At this line the depth suddenly decreases, as though the edge of a submerged Antarctic plateau to find the southerly rim of its basin there. This ocean contains several large and some groups of small islands, but these are mostly near the shore and connected with the neighboring continent by shallow waters, showing that they rise from a submerged plateau. The average depth of the Indian Ocean is about 14,000 feet, its surface water is warmer and saltier than that of any other, and its winds and weather are more regular and peaceful than in either the Atlantic or the Northern Pacific. The Arctic Ocean is the well-defined body of water around and probably over the North Pole. It is connected with the Pacific only by the narrow and very shallow Bering Strait, and with the Atlantic by comparatively narrow openings. It has been fairly well explored as far north as the parallel of 80 degrees and found to contain many islands, but it appears that there is great depth of water north of Spitsbergen and northeast of Greenland making it probable that the trough of the Atlantic reaches to or beyond the pole itself. Most of its area is covered with drifting ice. The Antarctic Ocean is regarded as the space of water within the Antarctic Circle, but this is surrounded by a zone of deep ocean, unbroken almost halfway to the equator except by the narrow southern part of South America 
and by New Zealand. It is an area apparently rather shallow of ice, fogs, and tempestuous gales enclosing lands of unknown extent. But these geographical distinctions are merely convenient methods of speech. After all, there is only one ocean poured round all, and its particles are incessantly changed in place and remingled by means of a worldwide system of tides and currents, the effect of which is to keep seawater everywhere uniform in character and perfectly pure and healthful. Chapter 2 Waves, Tides, and Currents Now that we have studied the ancient ocean, it is time to study its present characteristics and understand the great and important part it plays in the world. A very striking thing about the ocean is its flatness. Being water, it seeks always to find its level, and we commonly assume that it everywhere does so, and take the sea level as the standard from which to calculate all heights above or depths below its surface. That is, we assume that every part of the surface of the ocean when calm and at mean tide is exactly the same distance from the center of the globe. This, however, is not wholly true. Careful observation has shown that the Pacific is several feet lower on the western shore of the Isthmus of Darien than is the Atlantic on its eastern shore, a fact due, no doubt, to the crowding of water by the Gulf Stream into the Caribbean Sea. The Mediterranean is known to be somewhat higher than the Atlantic, and other differences exist in similar places elsewhere. This introduces the subject of depth, a matter which we have learned accurately only within a very few years. In the early days, ropes alone were used for sounding, and these had to be of considerable size to bear the strain. But a mile or so of rope became too heavy to handle, and depths below that length remained unmeasured. Then a little machine was tried, consisting of a heavy weight, having attached to it by a trigger a wooden float. This was thrown overboard. It sank, and when it touched bottom, the shock released the float. From the time that elapsed before the float reappeared, the depth was estimated. This, however, was little better than guesswork and accurate soundings exceeding 1,000 fathoms were not obtained until an American naval officer began to use wire instead of rope. From this hint was developed elaborate machinery operated by steam using steel piano wire, having automatic registers of the amount reeled out, and carried down by weights that were released when the bottom was struck making it easier to recover the wire. To these weights, or rather to the wire just above them, were attached devices for clutching and bringing to the surface specimens of the bottom, self-closing jars to fetch water from the lowest layer, self-registering thermometers, that recorded the temperatures at the greatest or at various intermediate depths, and other means of learning the character of the water, bottom material, and animal life several miles below the surface, including methods of photographing by aid of a submerged electric light. Such investigations, carried on in ships suitably equipped, have been prosecuted by several governments, 
most notably by the expedition of the Challenger, a British surveying ship which circumnavigated the globe during the years from 1872 to 1876. This and many other expeditions have sounded in all parts of the world and explored large tracts where the water uniformly exceeded three miles in depth. The United States ship Enterprise, after passing the Chatham Islands in her run from New Zealand to the Straits of Magellan, found the water everywhere more than 13,000 feet deep. Throughout her run from Montevideo to New York, the water varied from 12 to 18,000 feet deep and Captain Nares and Admiral Belknap found light depths over equally vast breadths elsewhere. Yet even in these basins, more profound pits and valleys exist. Several places are known near Japan and off Puerto Rico, exceeding five miles in depth, and an English officer sounded 29,400 feet in the southern Pacific Ocean, 1,900 miles east of Brisbane without finding bottom. The average depth of all the oceans is estimated at from 12,000 to 15,000 feet. As, according to Humboldt, the average height of the lands of the globe is only about 1,000 feet. It will be seen that all the land now above the water and its foundations could be shoveled into the ocean troughs and still leave water more than two miles in depth covering the whole planet. The soundings and dredgings of which I have spoken enable us to make a tolerable map of the ocean beds and to describe their features. All the continents are bordered by a shelf reaching out under the shallow shore water to a greater or less distance, and then dropping, usually with much abruptness, to the ocean trough. This shelf, perhaps originally a part of the primeval continent, bears most of the great islands near continents, such as Newfoundland, the West Indies, Great Britain and Ireland, Madagascar, the Aleutian, Japanese, and Philippine groups, the Malay Archipelago, and others. If you will look at a map that has marked upon it the line of 1,000 fathoms depth along the shores of the various continents, you will find it reaching far out from the eastern shores of both Americas the western and northern shores of Europe, the eastern shores of South Africa, prolonging India hundreds of miles and embracing great spaces among the East Indies, while even the hundred fathom line would connect many an island with the mainland or with some other island as they actually have been connected in times gone by. The fact is, there is not a single proper mountain peak rising out of deep water at any great distance from the margins of the continents. All the numerous islands of the wide oceans are either coral reefs or the summits of volcanic cones. Upon this shelf, and for the most part within 200 miles of the coast, are deposited all of the materials torn from the land by the sea or brought down by rivers or glaciers, excepting the very finest, which currents may float somewhat farther out, and also excepting the rocks that icebergs carry away and drop in mid-ocean. But this is not a great amount, for most icebergs strand on the shallows off Newfoundland or in the Bering Sea. Almost nothing from the shores, therefore, reaches the central depths of the open oceans, whose beds are in substantially the same condition that they were in at the beginning, except for two things. 
volcanic upheavals in some places, and the remains of animal life everywhere. The former exception is a very important one, since it is now known, according to Professor Shaler, that volcanoes, by their eruptions, send more dust and broken materials to the seas than the rivers and shores combined. Although the deeper sea floors probably lack mountains, says Professor Shaler, they are not without striking reliefs which, if they could be seen, would present all the dignity which their size gives to the Himalaya or Andes. The difference is that these elevations are not true mountains, but volcanic peaks, sometimes isolated, again accumulated in long, narrow ridges, but all made up of matter poured out from the craters or through great fissures in the crust. So numerous are these heaped masses of lava and other ejections from these vents, that there is hardly any considerable area of the oceans where they do not rise above the surface. There are, indeed, thousands of these volcanic peaks distributed from pole to pole Thus, on the floor of the North Atlantic, there is evidently a long, irregular chain of these elevations, extending from the Icelandic group of islands southward to the Azores. If an explorer could view this part of the sea bottom, he would probably find that the line of craters was as continuous as that exhibited by the volcanoes of the Andes. Besides these volcanic peaks, Professor Shaler continues, the sea bottom in certain parts of the tropics is beset with the singular elevations formed by coral reefs. But of these, I shall have more to say toward the end of the book, and I allude to them here only as a feature of the invisible landscape beneath the waves. Over the vast, gently undulating spaces separating the submerged lines of volcanoes and the ridges of coral lies a mat of mud of unknown thickness, which naturalists term ooze. It is principally composed of volcanic dust and of the microscopic tests or flinty, limey skeletons of minute animals few of which are large enough to be seen by the unaided eye. Dwelling in myriads in the superficial parts of the sea, these foraminifera, as they are termed, sink at death to the bottom, over which they accumulate a thick coating of minutely divided limestone powder, forming a layer of ooze as unsubstantial as the finest snow. In regions like the North Atlantic, this ooze consists almost wholly of such animal matter, but in other regions, such as the South Pacific, where volcanoes prevail, it is constantly and largely increased by an enormous quantity of mineral matter hurled broadcast by volcanoes, all of which are on islands or near sea coasts. A part of this is the merest dust, which slowly settles from the air, perhaps hundreds of miles from where it was ejected. A larger part consists of that spongy lava called pumice, which is so full of holes filled with air and gases that it may float halfway around the globe before it sinks, as happened after the explosion of Krakatoa. Into the oceanic ooze, too, sinks so much of all dead fishes and other mid-sea animals as is not dissolved or devoured before reaching it, and it forms the grave of thousands of men. It is often said that ships and other things would not sink far, but would float, suspended by dense water or some miraculous influence 
only a few hundred or a few thousand feet below the surface, for no one knows how long. But this eerie notion has no foundation in fact. No other fate, we are assured by those who know, awaits the drowned sailor or his ship than that which comes to the marine creatures who die on the bottom of the sea. In time, their dust all passes into the great storehouse of the earth, even as those who receive burial on land. Wooden wrecks probably last much longer than those of iron. I have mentioned that a small part of what the sea tears away from the land or receives from rivers, winds, and other sources is dissolved in its waters, which now contain, no doubt, samples of every ingredient of the rocks and soils of the dry land, and very likely some elements not yet detected. This solvent power of the sea explains its saltness, and it must go on growing more and more bitter as long as its waves grind at the shores and the rivers run down. The salinity varies in degree, water at great depths being salter than that near the surface, and excelling in saltness where evaporation is rapid, as under the trade winds, while fresher in the regions of equatorial calms where an immense amount of rain falls. Broadly, the lightest or freshest water is found at the equator, and the heaviest in the temperate regions. Enclosed or nearly enclosed areas become very salt. Thus, the Dead Sea is what chemists call a saturated solution, being nearly one-third or 28% salt, and Great Salt Lake in Utah is not far behind. The Red Sea contains 4%, and some parts of the Mediterranean nearly as much. Taking all the open oceans together, about three and a half in every 100 parts, or three and one half percent, is composed of various salts, more than three quarters of which is common salt, or chloride of sodium, and the remainder mainly forms of magnesium. One of the Challenger authors has estimated that the oceans contain enough salt to make a layer 170 feet thick over their whole area. And another writer says that the amount, if heaped up, would be four times larger than the whole bulk of Europe above the level of high water mark, mountains and all. In early times indeed, seawater, which yields about a quarter of a pound of crystallized salt per gallon, was almost the only source of salt for food. Even yet, it is the principal source of supply for the manufacture of commercial salt in France, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Austria, the West Indies, and Central and South America, and it is largely used in Holland, Belgium, and Great Britain. The early process, still extensively practiced in some parts of Europe, was to admit the seawater to large partitioned flats floored with clay, where it evaporated rapidly. The salt crystals remaining were then collected, purified to a greater or less degree, and sold offhand. It was by similar means that our great-grandfathers in New England and along the southern coasts provided themselves with salt, only they used large vats arranged over fires instead of earthen basins exposed to the sun. But analysis of seawater discloses small quantities of many other recognizable minerals. 
Silica must be there to supply the needs of many foraminifera, sponges, and other animals. Lime in various forms exists, or else such sea animals as mollusks could not compose their shells, nor polyps erect their enormous reefs. Bromine is present, and to the iodine and other mineral dyes in the water, we owe the lovely purples, crimsons, and scarlets painting corallines, seaweeds, echinoderms, and some molluscan shells, as that of the sargasso snail, Chanthina. As for gold and silver, both are present. I have seen it stated that a voyage of a year or two is sufficient to permit the formation of a film of silver all over the copper sheathing of a ship's bottom, so that a frigate returning from a long cruise is really silver-plated. But I fancy this is more a matter of imagination than visible reality. Gold, in certain chemical combinations, certainly exists in seawater and may be extracted therefrom. Up to the present, however, the cost of the extraction has been more than the precious metal obtained was worth. Gold is often washed from sea sand. The ceaseless restlessness of the ocean forms another of the greatest contrasts between it and the immovable land, terra firma, as those like to call it, who have been tossing too long on the rolling deep. This characteristic restlessness involves some of the most important and interesting facts in physical geography. For were the waters still, that is, were the oceans simply huge, quiet ponds, none of that action could take place along the shores which has been so important an agent in shaping the world and making it a suitable place for human habitation and social development. On a planet with an atmosphere and changing seasons like ours, however, a stagnant ocean is as impossible as a motionless air. Indeed, it is because the air is always in motion that large bodies of water are never at rest, for it is the changing density and temperature and movements of the air that produce waves and currents. Waves are caused by the pressure and friction of the wind upon the surface of the water, as you may readily see at any pond, and the water in them simply rises and falls driving forward a little at the very surface, so as to cause a gentle current called wind drift. When the waves approach the shallow, sloping border of the land, they are checked at the bottom by the slope of the beach, while the freer upper part goes forward, and the waves speedily lose their rounded form and become more and more sharply ridged and steep on the front side as they sweep on, until at last they pitch forward in the crash and thunder of surf. In the open ocean, the waves are usually doing little work, except to cause the surface to rise and fall. The harder the wind blows, the higher the waves become, and the faster they travel. This speed has been calculated and has been found to be proportionate to size. Waves 200 feet long from hollow to hollow, we are told, travel about 19 knots per hour. Those of 400 feet in length make 27 knots, and those of 600 feet rush forward irresistibly at 32 knots. These, of course, are under the furious impulse of a gale, and it is marvelous that ships can be made to ride over them. Nor is it any wonder that excited mariners, clinging to the bulwarks of some small and healing craft, 
should call them mountain high and declare in all seriousness that they have seen their crests rising 100 feet above their hollows. No such altitude, nor half of it probably, is ever reached by a storm wave in the heaviest cyclone. An excellent authority, Lieutenant Qualtro, assures us that the highest trustworthy measurements are from 44 to 48 feet. The height of a wave depends upon what mariners call its fetch, that is, its distance from the place where the waves began to form. This has been worked out mathematically by Thomas Stevenson, father of the late Robert Louis Stevenson, the novelist, an eminent engineer and designer of lighthouses, who gives the following formula. The height of the wave in feet is equal to one and one half multiplied by the square root of the fetch in nautical miles. If the waves began 100 miles away from your ship, the waves about you will be 15 feet high, because the square root of 100 is 10, and one and a half times 10 is 15 feet. The highest waves are not formed in the greatest tempests, which beat down their crests, but when the gale is both very strong and long continued. The worst seas, as sailors call big waves, are those met with off the Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn. The depth to which wave disturbance extends depends on the violence of the wind and nearshore upon the slope of the bottom. Prestwich tells us that pebbles may sometimes be moved at the depth of 100 feet and sand much deeper, as is shown by the fact that the bottom is disturbed in heavy storms on the banks of Newfoundland. The weight and power of such onrushing masses of water are tremendous, as appears from the effect on coasts where they strike. But this opens up a subject which is too large for treatment here, and I must refer readers to geological treatises and to such special works as Professor N. S. Shaler's excellent Sea and Land, where the work of the ocean in tearing down and building up its coasts is fully and entertainingly explained. I shall have something more to say on this point also when I come to the chapter Dangers of the Deep and speak of the terrible destruction caused by earthquakes and in certain other agitations of the sea not due to the wind and often styled tidal waves. There is only one kind of tidal wave, properly speaking, however, and this is a theoretical rather than an actual one, perceptible usually only in that rising and falling of the water along coasts, twice each 24 hours, that we call the flow and ebb of the tides. And here we see the effect rather than the thing itself. And with that convenient pause in the text, I think we'll end this evening's reading from the Book of the Ocean by Ernest Ingersoll. I'm always interested to discover how old some of our knowledge of the world is, and also how new some of the things we now take for granted. I hope it kept just enough of your attention as well. If you'd like to read this book for yourself, I'll be sure to leave a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or send me an email via our website, www. Dot boringbookspod.com. I always love hearing from you. 
Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.